Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And we're going to start with the baptism of Jesus. And then we're going to go into the next chapter, and we're going to read the first 11 verses of chapter 4. So we're going to start with Matthew 3.16, with Jesus' baptism, and then we're going to go on to uh, Jesus' testing in the wilderness, uh, or temptation in the desert, whatever your Bible translates. And then we'll, we'll go on and we'll stop at verse 11. So let's start with Matthew 3. 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Chapter 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to, or just took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. I'll start out by saying that it is a great joy to be back here among you guys. Um, I've been thinking about you ever since I left. uh, You probably don't know how many people in Alabama have seen your faces (laughs) and uh, watched videos with you in them, Um, but but they have, and, and they've been thinking about you and even praying for you and about you as well, and, and that's just been such an encouragement to me, so I knew as soon as I was wrapping up my graduation, I had to come back, you know, while I had some free time. And as Ryan and I were making these plans, I remembered something that Ryan taught me while he was, um, you know, my, mentoring me uh, when I was here about nine months ago. And he said, you know, if you go to a place and do ministry there, you should know exactly why you're going, what you want to accomplish and as I was thinking through this, and I was, you know, on my way here, I, I kind of thought I knew what that was. I had, you know, kind of made a list and written it down, and I would put a lot of thought into it. But after I got here, after a couple of days, I actually started to question that. I, I remember I had received a lot of bad news one day, you know, most importantly, Patricia. And I was really excited to see her. And... And as I went home that night, there was this voice in my head, much like perhaps the voice Jesus hears in the wilderness. And, and this voice was saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Scott? Why did you come? And I just, it just, it was knocking me down to the ground. And I, I went to sleep that night without an answer. When I woke up the next day, I opened my Bible and I started reading from Romans as Paul writes to the Romans, on his way to where he's going, not India, but Spain. Um, And uh, and he says, you know, I'm going to you, you know, for this reason, that I might get some encouragement from you and that I may encourage you. And that might happen while I'm there. And I shared this with Ryan and and, and he blessed that. And 
You know, and that's, and praise the Lord, that is what it has been over the last three weeks. I've seen and met with a lot of you guys, and, and that is simply what it's been. Encouragement given, encouragement received. No more, no less. And, and that's just been a, a, a beautiful thing to me. That, that was the, the reason. And uh, as you know, in Romans, after that, Paul proceeds to rip into the Roman church. And so I'll do that now. I'm <laughs> joking. Uh, <laughs> No, no, no. What I'd really like to do is kind of proceed with what we have been talking about the last couple of weeks. So we've been talking about, you know, from, from Ryan's past two sermons, our attachment to Jesus Christ. First in Romans, that nothing will separate us from the love of Christ. And in John 15, with Jesus' command to abide in me, with the result being that through our attachment to Jesus Christ... We share in his spirit and bear the fruit of the spirit. That is, the connection that we have to God through the Holy Spirit becomes visible to others. That is the fruit. That is the result that we want, the visibility of Jesus Christ on earth. And this morning, I want to add something to that discussion of what it means to abide in Christ with the New Testament account of Jesus' baptism and his subsequent testing in the wilderness. Now, these passages warrant, as you have probably already received, many hours of investigation. But today, I want us to see broadly here how God, you know, through these verses, through these passages, how God defeats sin. This is the sin that first separated God and human beings from each other. That is actually what sin is. Sin is separation from God. Whatever it is that God desires, whatever is not that, is sin. And if we miss this, if we think of sin, if we limit it to only our idea of disobedience to our idea of his written commands, we miss what God is showing us in these passages. And we are apt to limit our understanding of Jesus' time in the wilderness as a bit of good teaching on how Jesus avoided temptation and how you can too. But that's not what this is. This really singular account of baptism and testing um, shows us not how Jesus avoided sin and temptation, but how God utterly overcame and defeated sin and death. And though this subject requires, again, many more Sundays of teaching, this account also begins to let us in on why it had to be through Jesus Christ. You see, this account closely harmonizes with what we've been looking at the past couple of weeks because it's really about relationship and a specific kind of relationship. It's about the relationship that configures and qualifies all Christian relationships, this being the relationship of the three persons of the triune God, which we see here at Jesus' baptism. You see, the opposite of sin is not obedience, not quite. It's togetherness. Obedience characterizes the relationship God desires with us as being with God in the way God designed Seeking obedience for its own sake, you may have already found, usually results in seeking our own idea of obedience at the cost of relationships with God and with others. The Trinity revealed to us at Jesus' baptism communicates to us the relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ, and it also configures the relationships we have with others. This is the relationship that we have been talking about. Nothing can separate us, Paul says in Romans. Stay in me, and I will stay in you. Jesus teaches his disciples this, this depth of interconnectedness, what in classical doctrine, you know, you may have heard we call mutually indwelling. Jesus also teaches this as true of the relationship between him and his father. And this message of restored relationship through Jesus Christ is revealed in Matthew 3 as a message presently visible 
as the loving operation of grace performed by the Trinity, in which God the Father communicates God the Son through God the Holy Spirit, proclaiming his identity, his judgment, and his purpose to those gathered as witnesses. He says, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And I know this only looks like two things, but we'll get to that. But first, we need to parse this out. We need to know what's going on here, because this interaction, this event, is exactly what Satan challenges in chapter 4, verse 3. So look at that. What does Satan say? What does Satan say to Jesus? If you are the Son of God. So Satan here is directly challenging what God has just said. And clearly, the entire passage shows us how Satan attacks the Word of God. He denies what God has said, first. Second, he denies God's trustworthiness. Number three, he deceives his quarry, the person he's talking to, by suggesting that Satan can be satisfied, the question of God's trustworthiness can be answered by the performance of a task that Satan dictates. Then, what kind of proof is that? Where is God? You know, this only presents itself to us as a temptation if we find anything reasonable about what Satan has just said. But if Jesus did this, would it really prove what Satan is challenging? Logically? No. And let's just say, while we're here, that you and I, when we do this, we take the place of Satan and become one of his children when we make up tests for God, and also for others according to our own reasoning. If he really was a good Christian, if he really loves me, if she really loves me, the only thing that we know that is true of another person is what God says about them. Don't do Satan's work for him. And this clues us in that perhaps a stronger translation of the word represented here as tempt would be better stated as test. Something about Jesus is being tested, but what? And what kind of test is this? And tests can be good as long as the testing tool lines up specifically with what is being tested. You can't measure the temperature of the ocean with a ruler. But if I buy a rope that I want to use for rock climbing, I'm definitely wanting the strength of the interwoven strands holding it together to be tested to hold my weight, lest it break and I fall to my death. But you can't test the tensile strength of a rope by challenging it to make you a cup of tea. This is the kind of testing we have here. And an appropriate test will reveal something. So what is being tested and what is being revealed? What is being tested, as we have seen in part, is the very message God the Father sends to God the Son through God the Holy Spirit. And as we have seen, the recipient of the message, who is also the content of the message, is also being tested. And third, the transmission of this message, the connection from father to son, is also being tested. So three things. Let's look at the last one first, uh, the connection. At Jesus' baptism, God is proclaiming. He is communicating. He is sending a message. The activity of the Trinity is revealed here. Not only so that we may know how God communicates, but that we may also know that God is the source of all communication. It doesn't come from us. It's a gift. 
The loving activity of the Trinity is the source of all communication. And we can begin to understand the Trinity's activity as a loving operation of grace through the imprint of God on ourselves, the image of God on ourselves. We find in our capacity to participate in communication the design of God. We proclaim, we can talk. From whatever is in your mind, in your heart, or your will, you can and do speak. You send your word out via your breath. And this is what you do when you speak, when you communicate with others. Whatever is in your mind, according to your will, you exert. You send out into reality as meaning-making sounds conveyed by your breath, and you can do this because you were created in the image of God. And like God, we send our words out into reality to change reality. But it was God who first formed all reality, all creation, through his word. God also puts himself into creation the same way. As the activity of the Trinity where the Father, being the source, his mind, his will, conveys his Son, the Word of God, through his breath, the Spirit of God. This is what God is doing throughout all of Scripture. God communicates himself to us as an act of grace. He also chooses some from among us to participate in himself as prophets in the Old Testament, to communicate himself through human voices. And this choosing is what Scripture calls love. And just as God communicated the world into existence, he fully revealed himself in the form of Jesus, whom he communicated down to us when God's word became flesh. And this is what God does. Our God is living and active, and he continues to communicate himself through Jesus Christ with the message of Jesus Christ. And that's the first thing. The transmission of God to God is conveyed by God, the Holy Spirit. And here's the second thing. What about the message? That's also being tested. What is the message? The message of God the Father to God the Son through God the Holy Spirit is the same message available to us through Christ alone. It is the gospel of or the good news about Jesus Christ for us. And for us, the most fundamental way we can describe the gospel message is that it is a message that lifts us up, or we can call it an uplifting message, if you like. Have you ever received a message that has lifted you up, literally? You know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm pretty introverted. You know, I've been to parties and meetings where I didn't know anybody before. And it's hard to jump in, you know. If you've ever been to this situation, maybe you remember a time when you're kind of standing there and not knowing Oh, how's this going to go? And then someone comes up to you and says, hi. And that hi changes everything. You smile. Your face literally lifts up. You're not alone anymore. Your very destiny at this party has changed. Perhaps your whole life. You don't know. That is... (laughs) This is what... This is what all meaningful communication does. It changes reality. But in our normal human reality, these messages always come with a cost. You have to live up to that high, don't you? You must be worthy of it. You must be a good conversation partner, right? But God's message is unique. Because the content of God's message does not oblige you to live up to it. Rather, its content lifts you up to its namesake, the gospel. 
And notice what the father says to the son. Look at this. This is my beloved son. This is my son. I love him. Now, as we said, according to scripture, love is a kind of choosing. It is not the choice to love. The act of choosing is love. God the Father chooses God the Son to do the will of God. This is communicated throughout the Bible and with my favorite passage being Isaiah 49. You don't have to go there, but I'll read it to you. And in Isaiah 49, this is where the Messiah himself speaks and he says, And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength, he says. Messiah is talking about his God. This is what God says. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise the tribes of Israel, or raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach the, to the end of the earth. That's, that's God choosing his son. And in this message, we see identity. We see purpose. And finally, we see judgment, which is related to that purpose with him, I am well pleased. But hold on. This is Jesus' baptism. And we got the message. We know his purpose. But Christ's work to reconcile the world to his Father is not yet finished. But, but God proclaims that I'm already pleased with you. He has not lived up to the message. No, the message has lifted him up. You can see he literally comes up out of the water to the message. You see, the father's judgment of the son is as timeless as his choosing the son. This is because God is everlasting. His love is everlasting. He is the eternal God and his message is eternal. This means that God's pronouncement over his son is not only always and everlastingly true, but continuously flowing, continuously being carried from the Father to the Son by the Spirit. Though we witness the proclamation in one moment of time, the proclamation of judgment, of righteousness over the Son is continuous, meaning that the Spirit of God is, even now, ministering to the Son the will and judgment of the Father, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In the same way, the third thing, the recipient of the message, Jesus Christ, who is also the content of this message, is caught up in the transmission of this message. He is part of all three. In other words, he is inseparable from his Father and from his Father's Spirit and his own. How does Jesus defeat sin in the wilderness? By being God. You see, every test is an invitation from Satan to judge the will of God, to judge the Word of God, and to judge the connection between God and his Word. And the tests reveal that there is no separation between them. And this is exactly what human beings are inclined to do when we experience these tests. We judge God. And there's always a sense of separation in judgment. We experience the first test as self-protection. When we think that God is somehow holding out on us, we judge his will, his character, his heart, according to ourselves and our circumstances. We ignore his word, his son, and thus judge the father apart from the son. We experience the second test when we mistakenly open the Bible to find ourselves and to find our own answers instead of God. 
We judge God's word when we separate it from the Father and wield it for our own purposes, just like Satan. We read scripture and we think, it's about me. It's not about God, it's about me. But no, it's about God. Interestingly, the final test comes out a little bit different. The final test no longer denies the relationship between son and father. It's about power. It's about the power to impact the whole world. Now, there are spirits of power over nations and cities, to be sure, but any spirit, any power disconnected from the word of God and the will of God is not the spirit of God. You see, this is what Satan cannot understand. When I was a kid, I used to wonder why Satan would set himself up for failure like this. He must have known, right? Like, yeah, but, but Satan doesn't get it. Satan fails because he cannot fathom the everlasting, inseparable quality of the Trinity. In other words, he cannot understand love. He cannot understand that deep, interconnected togetherness of the Trinity that is true love, that is the source of love. He assumes that there must be some separation because that is what Satan is all about. Separation. Judgment. And again, there's always this sense of separating when it comes to judgment. Who is good? Who is bad? Sheep. Goats. Worth my time. Not worth my time. As a church, as a Christian, which one do you practice? What is your message? Is it separation or reconciliation? Is it individual judgment? Is it an evaluation of resources? Is it the comfort of silence? Or is it togetherness? Sin began when Adam and Eve judged God as separate from his word. They judged themselves as better off, separated from God. And that judgment continued until the word of God himself came to live among us and show us that no, there is no separation. That the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one. And when the high priest judged Jesus as a danger to the political balance, when the mob judged him as not quite the Messiah they wanted, and when Rome judged him as a necessary scapegoat for world peace under Roman power, they made their injustice complete when they executed him on the cross. But God said no. To all human judgment, God said no. To the judgment of self-protection, the judgment of future prosperity, to the judgment of a better society, God said no. The message of God, the judgment of God, lifted Jesus Christ up out of the grave. This is my son. And if you are in Christ, then this message is your message. Someone is standing up for you right now and saying, no, this is my daughter. This is my son. And this message is your message. This is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And it would be a misunderstanding to say that this message to those who are in Christ saves us from God's judgment. No, we revel in God's judgment where he everlastingly proclaims us to be good and pleasing to him. Even though our job is not yet finished, our judgment is complete. You have already been judged and that judgment has lifted you up. You are saved, not from God's judgment, from, but from every other judgment, from all human judgment. 
But for any of you, if you are still clinging to human judgment, for any of you who are still clinging to your right to name what is good and what is bad, who is good and who is bad, I want to tell you that you are absolutely free to let go, not to fall into the abyss, but to be taken up, to be lifted up into Christ and out of binding death. Because there is no more judgment. There is no more separation. Abide in me. Stay. Stay with me. Go where I go. And this is for you, the church. This is for you. Jesus Christ, for you, the judge, judged in your place, means that giving up, letting go of your judgment is not optional. This means that you no longer need to self-evaluate. Do you realize how much energy you spend every day constantly evaluating yourself and others? And this, this is what I want to give to you guys. This is your homework. Write it down if you can. I want you to take note of how often you self-evaluate, how often you evaluate others. I want you to think about how this dialogue goes and goes in your head. And a good indicator of how much you need this is how much time you spend explaining yourself to others. That is, how much time and effort do you spend outwardly justifying yourself? You see, this is where Christians often find themselves. Like Jesus, you find yourself standing in the wilderness, challenged with the words of the accuser, if you really are a Christian. And most of the time, if we're being honest, you just stand there and listen without ever giving an answer and, with, and without ever moving on. You are constantly plagued by worry and judgment, well, because you really are. You're just standing there and listening to the voice inside your head telling you that you can't do anything. And if this is you, it really may be that you understand the message, that you have received it. Like Jesus, the Word of God and the Spirit of God are continually ministering to you, but you find yourself unmoving because you have failed to understand that in Christ, the message of God is not only to you and for you, but through you. In other words, you are stuck here in Matthew 4, in the wilderness, right before entering ministry and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Isn't that fun? Do you like hanging out in the desert with Satan? But here's the solution. And this is going to sound radical here. In our post-enlightenment, semi-postmodern, individualistic, consumeristic context, this is going to be pretty radical. But here it is. Give up your judgment of yourself and others and give it to the church. Whoa. Now, just because the medievals messed this up in the long run doesn't mean that this is not actually what Paul and the other New Testament writers teach again and again. Throw yourself into ministry. There is no judgment. Your judgment has already been pronounced. Throw yourself into ministry and let your pastor evaluate things with you. Invite your elders and deacons and brothers and sisters to evaluate how your ministry is going with you. To show you in this new context, in this new life, how you can do this better. What stumbling blocks do we see together? This is the body of Christ on earth. There can be no separation when we are unified under the head by the Spirit, where your burdens are our burdens. And together we are children of the kingdom. Just stay. Give up these burdens. Stay with Christ and move on with Him. And let's do it together. Now let's pray. Father God, thank you.
for this message. Not my message, Lord. But I stand up in this every day, even though it's a struggle. And, and I pray, Lord, that we all do. Lord, that we receive this message, that we know that this message is for us. This message is to us. And this message is through us. Lord, I pray whatever holds us back, whatever burdens us and keeps us from new life in your word, in your message, Lord, that that would be revealed, dissolved, that we would finally be able to let go. Lord, let us know at every moment that you are with us, that you are speaking to us, that you are not silent, Lord, and we have voice so that the world may not ever know that you are. Lord, lift us up as you lifted up your son. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.